For all of you fitness fanatics, those of you that train hard, you serious strength training individuals, one of the best things you can do to build muscle and strength is take time off. It's true. Studies show that oftentimes athletes gain the most strength during those weeks that they reduce the intensity and the volume or sometimes take it off completely. Remember, muscle growth doesn't happen during the workout. It's the recovery process where you see that amazing thing happen. So if you haven't taken any time off in a long time or you're constantly redlining, reduce the intensity, reduce the volume, or take some time off. Watch what happens. You'll probably come back stronger. Did the live event prompt this with some of the questions and stuff that we had? Is this where this is coming from for you? No, no. I was reading... Um, oh, interesting, because this was a lot of... When you know when we break off yeah. after we do the quads and we are the last I had a lot of conversations like this too. Yeah, yeah so uh, I, that's why I totally thought that you were going that way because of that because I had a thought. You had a lot of questions around that. Well, so I just I was when we left. It was something that I was going to bring up anyway. So it's interesting you uh, you use this as a fitness tip today. Because here we are in a room full of a lot of, uh, you know, fitness people. Health, they've been in it. A lot of them were health professionals, right? I, I don't know what percentage of the room you would say were trainers. I think at one point we asked them to raise their hand if they were coaches or trainers. It was like half. At least yeah, there's a, yeah, there a good, decent amount of Obviously, them. everybody's, you know, into fitness. That's that. Right. And so it's interesting that, and so and everybody listens to the podcast. Most all of them have been listening for years. So one, you have a group of people who've listened to the message from us for a very long time that we've been presenting. Mm -hmm. Uh, two are already uh, like well versed in fitness because they've been doing it for years, or they are an actual fitness professional. Yeah. And really, no shit. Yet, this is a challenge for them. So it's such a reminder to me on man. If you have these people that that grasp it, that listen to us, that are professionals in the space, and they still struggle with this conversation, like how many of the average Jane and Joes that go to the gym? really don't understand this. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's interesting because the data keeps coming out on this. You know, you know what prompted me to talk about this was my, my talk at the Peptide Congress uh, event. And so when I did my talk, I was just looking for studies to back up a lot of the stuff I talk about when it comes to strength training. For context, I was speaking to a room full of health practitioners. Doctors, nurses. Doctors, nurses, functional medicine practitioners uh, who are there to learn about uh, peptides, how to use them with their patients. And my talk had nothing to do with peptides. Uh, that's not my expertise. It was all around strength training. So I was looking up studies, ones that I had cited before, um, but I just wanted, you know, I'm in a room full of doctors. Like, I want to have the study, you know, yeah, yeah, ready yeah. to go because yeah. anybody can say a study says, right? Yeah. So I was looking up studies on uh, deload weeks, and um, there's a lot of them. There's, there's quite a few out there. And deload weeks, for people who don't know, this is when a strength athlete, like a power lifter, will train really, really hard uh, for a certain period of time. Then they'll take a week where they train with a dramatically reduced amount of intensity or volume or both, um, or they'll take the week off and they call this a deload week. And studies show that during those deload weeks, many athletes see a boost in strength and muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and that just shows that they we need more recovery than we think and or we do more than is necessary um, to make things happen in terms of uh, athletic performance and muscle and strength. Anytime you go over what's necessary, all you do is compromise your recovery, right? Once, Matt, if, if the muscle building signal was like, like a light switch, and it's not, it's more complicated than that, but if it was like a light switch, once you turn the light switch off, leave it on, leave it alone, anything else you do is just going to make it harder um, for that process to, uh, to, to manifest because now you're compromising recovery. So as I'm looking at these studies, it's like, like one of the studies, like uh, one of the, uh, some of the data shows that, and I talked about this in my talk, the amount of strength training required to prevent muscle loss. So not build muscle, but as you age, I don't know what the numbers show, but it's something like for every decade you get like older, 10%. you lose like five or 10% or yeah, I think more. It's, I think I've the, read a few that are like 1% a year is kind of something like that, yeah, right? Yeah, it's like 10% yeah. of muscle strength and, and, and mass a year. So uh, how much strength training is required just to stop that? Not build muscle. But just prevent that. And it's something like one workout every two weeks. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> so little. Now, this is good news because, uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to work out all the time. Uh, but for fitness fanatics, yeah. this is also good Falls news. Falls on deaf ears. Yeah, maybe it's like, hey, guys, we're probably doing way more than is necessary. And we will get better results if we schedule. Like, you don't have to take a week off. I know how hard that is. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I'm one of those people. But we probably would get better results if like something like every six weeks or every five weeks or so, 
we did like this really easy week of working out where we just go in the gym and instead of doing 10 sets, we did five and we did, you know, 50% intensity that we're normally used to. And what'll probably happen is we'll get, uh, better results. I mean, that's where all the, the progress happens. Is well, in the it's funny. Cause that's the, um, that's what everybody wants is, is the, um, the actual results and to get to yeah. that point. And I think we just, we somehow have really focused on selling the idea of like working out is good for you and like yeah. doing the work is good for you and to really like enjoy it and figure out how to incorporate this as a lifestyle thing. And it's like, um, but it gets to a point where, okay, maybe they've, they've caught on to that and they got the bug and then they love training and, but, but lose sight of the fact that like, you got to do what's most beneficial for you specifically. And recovery is a huge component huge, to that. Huge. I had a client once I'll never forget. There was, it was a marathon, uh, competitor and, uh, marathon competitors were really hard for me at first to train because it was really hard for me to adjust my training to complement theirs because they'd already done, they were already doing so much running that, and I didn't realize at the time, I thought I was giving them appropriate amounts of strength training, but it turned out that for a while I had to keep scaling it back till I found the right dose. And I'll never forget. I had this client. I don't remember how many miles they were running a week. Uh, but it's, we scaled it back to one strength training workout a week. Um, and we would do like two exercises. The rest was mobility. So it was very basic, easy and simple. And then I took her running her, the miles that she ran and we cut them in half. I didn't cut them 10%. We cut them in half and her, her times went through the roof. Mm -hmm. yeah. She was having, she was struggling qualifying for the Boston marathon, cut our, her volume in half. And I remember the conversation we had, I sat down and I said, look, we have nothing to lose. Uh, let's just cut everything in half and, uh, let's see what happens. And in, you know, four weeks we'll test your time. And she crushed her previous record, uh, from doing that. And of course, you know, typical trainer. I don't, I don't apply it to myself, right? It's like, oh, that's right for you, but I'll just work out as much as I can, you know, type of deal. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give some strategies, by the way, because I know there's fitness fanatics listening right now that when I say they love working out so much that when I say skip the gym or go easy, it's like, no. That's not going to work for me. Here's what you could do. Here's another thing you could do. Besides cutting sets and intensity, which is the best thing you do, volume and intensity, is go from exercises that go cause more damage to exercises that cause less damage. So let's say your workout calls for barbell squats. Okay, well, instead of doing barbell squats, I'm going to push a sled. Mm -hmm. Let's say your workout calls for deadlifts. Well, instead of a deadlift, I think I'll just do some cable rows or something like that, or maybe some or back single leg deadlift, some back hyper extensions or, or single leg deadlifts. So that's another thing you could do is you could do a week of exercises that are easier on the body to give you that deload uh, phenomena where you come back um, and you're stronger. So the other tip I have for those people would be to, uh, and I said this to several people at the, that talk we had, I said, um, reevaluate your why. Um, Simon Sinek's book, uh, Start With Why, such a great business book, but I find there's a lot of parallels with the the advice related to you know rem remembering your why in business as the same uh, as the whys of why you exercise and you work out. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you guys saw the one lady that I kind of called out that was, you know, saying, oh, I asked her, why do you do this? Yeah. Oh, it's for this, this, <laughs> that. Keep asking conflicting yeah. questions. Yeah, but then she was asking muscle and body fat percentage. And I said, wait mm. a second, that, that wasn't even in your why, why you do this. So why all the questions around that? Yeah. Like, so, and I, I ended up having these other talks or conversations with these other people. And I found myself repeating that to people is like, and a, and a few of them had this like very much so kind of aha moment, like almost like they're like, oh my God, you're so right. Like, um, I'm telling you, this is why I work out, yeah. you know, because I want to be a better husband and I want to have energy and I want to be in my eighties and be able to be mobile and do these things. And it's like, you list all these things and, and nowhere in there does it say, uh, need to train six days a week. Nowhere in there says I need to be at 7% body fat. Nowhere in there says you need to have a bench press at 315. Yet you guys are all asking me questions related to those things. Yeah. Well, so, you know, reevaluating your why and just make, and, and then I told all those people too, I said, Hey, there's nothing wrong too with your, if your why is I want to get jacked. My goal is to get as jacked as I can yeah. and, and get on stage one day. And like, I'm not, it's not for, for me to determine your why or what, but when, what I see in our space a lot, both in the professionals and in the consumer side is people say one thing, but then their actions and behaviors around nutrition exercise 
contradict it. Yeah, you know, there's a reverse engineer way to do that, right? Is instead of saying, what's my why? Examine what you're doing and say, what do my actions demonstrate my why is? Yeah, but that's me doing that would be, would put a wall up. Me pointing out their why. Of it's course. better for them to reevaluate their yes. why and go, well, this is what I say I'm doing, but then these are the things that right. I'm actually taking action right. on doing. It's like, well, if you're doing all this and you say it's because you want to be more active and be a better husband, well, okay, would the seven days a week go into the gym for an hour be better? Or actually maybe three of those hours of those seven hours, uh, maybe you spend an extra hour with your wife or your kid instead and pick some, I mean, if that's truly what you're telling me your why is, is related to being a better husband and a better, and a better wife, but then you decide that you can't miss the gym uh, for an hour or so days. And I tell you, yes, you can. You absolutely can do that. In fact, if your why is to be a better husband, a better partner, better these things like that, well, then don't you think that dedicating that hour to doing something like that would be more beneficial? Yeah. Actions are loud, much louder, aren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and, you know, and there's nothing wrong, again, with having different seasons of your life or maybe even your why changes where sometimes you are focused on those things. So I don't want, I don't want to come off like I'm judging people that want to get jacked or want to get a bench press. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But what I find is most interesting or what I see most common. Is it aligning with what yeah, you're is, saying? Is, is, yeah, is a lot of times. The, and, and, and why that's important is because it normally highlights something else going on. It normally highlights that you're using the gym to run away from something else, or you're or you're saying that this is important, but deep down, actually, that's not. Maybe you're you have you're more vain. It's okay, and, but you don't want to admit, admit it. To you yourself. don't want to admit it to yourself <laughs> that you really care about. Like so, I just think it's important that you're you're consistently reevaluating well, why you do these things, totally. um, uh, and why why are you going to the gym and that, and then making sure do your actions truly align with what you say is your main goal. When it comes to fitness or your performance in the gym, the following is true. You are only as strong as your weakest link. All right, this is an old saying, but it literally means if you think of a chain, it can only pull as much as its weakest link can hold on to. Well, your body has governors as well. In other words, if your grip is weak, if you don't have good stabilization or good control, then your strength will be limited. Your body will limit your strength, thus limiting your gains and your progress. So remember this with your workouts. So grip is an obvious one, right? Because if you can't pick up the bar, you can't hold on to the bar for deadlift, it's obvious. What other ones that like come to mind when you think about like limiting factors that I think people don't realize in like movements? This happens all the time with the big lifts. So yes. when you first start working out, you want to focus on those big lifts. But if that's all you ever focus on, at some point what you'll find is these weird nagging aches and pains like, yeah, I can bench and I bench a lot, but my shoulder always kind of bothers me, you know, mm -hmm. maybe in the front or the back or my overhead press. Once I get past this weight, I seem to injure myself or when I squat, I feel it on the side of yeah, my, my knee. knee hurts. Yeah, and then what people tend to do is they'll wear like knee wraps or braces or belts you know, or straps. Yeah, just to, or back, you know, back issues. Like I squat, squat, squat. And then all of a sudden I get this back pain. It's always in the same So spot. that's not what I was thinking about. What I was thinking about when I asked that was so limiting factor for deadlifts a lot of times uh, is grip strength, right? So you, oh. they, they, they're, you are too weak to hold on to the bar. And so it's not that your, your hips or your legs couldn't drive more weight. It's that you can't hold on the bar. And so that's a limiting factor. Squatting. I've seen this happen before where you just have a weak core. You have the mm -hmm. inability to completely. And then, well, that's what re results in the injuries. I right. Let about, power yeah. leaks out overhead press, like shoulder mobi mobility and stability. Like you yeah, can't instability there. You can't yeah. hold and sustain it overhead. So that I was seeking that from you, mm -hmm. right? Like, can you guys think of like these, cause everybody wants to have these strong where most people want to have mm -hmm. a, a big squat, a big deadlift, a big bench press, a big overhead squat or overhead press. But a lot of times they don't realize that what's keeping them from moving up in that weight isn't necessarily just moving more weight on the bar or doing more of that movement. Sometimes there is a weak link that is keeping them from progressing in that yes. lift they want to get strong in. And I wanted you guys to list some ideas of what those some of those could be. I know that grip strength sometimes is that for like the deadlift. I think mm -hmm. of core for that, or for the squat. Stability. I think for sh shoulder stability or mobility for overhead mm -hmm. pressing, even like bench press sometimes can be that you way. Know, the, the, what, this is literally, uh, your body literally protects itself. Your central nervous system will limit movement. It'll limit ranges of motion. It'll prevent you from expressing more strength than it believes is safe for you. This is why, by the way, under duress, 
you can actually, ten, you, you, you're able to express more strength, like the famous stories of the mom that lifts the car off the baby, and, but she never works out. How is that possible? Her body was like, this scary thing is more important well, than the fact that you can hurt yourself, and it allows you to exert more. But your, your central nervous system is controlling this. I think, uh, I guess an example, too, with that, uh, what you're talking about, Adam, is like range of motion, depth in that range of motion. Yep. So like it, getting deeper in a squat, all of a sudden now you don't have that kind of same force output. Like you're not familiar with that. Um, enough to where you've trained that. And so now, like a lot of times, uh, especially if you're in competition and, and, and you, now you're being judged and, and you're used to like going to a certain depth, but they want lower. Yeah. Uh, and then it's like very surprising and enlightening, like how your body doesn't respond the same way because you don't have that stability and that kind of uh, ability to generate force in, you know, a certain depth and a further range Here, of motion. Here's your evidence right here. You take somebody who's been working out for a while and they squat for a while. Then you have them wear a weight belt. Instantly add 20, 30 pounds to their lift or at least 10 pounds. How'd that happen? Are they are they are their quads stronger? Their hamstrings stronger? Their glutes mm -hmm. stronger? No, the belt produced an external form of stability. And so the body allowed them or that feeling of stability, that increased stability allowed them to generate more force. So these are all limiting factors that a lot of workout programs don't take into account. And so you see people, they don't realize that this is why their their lifts aren't going up or why they're not progressing. It's because, well, you're not training in, in the lateral plane, let's say, or you don't do anything with rotation. And so your body's stopping you in your tracks. Well, this was always my argument because, I mean, I – I mean, I'm a meathead at heart too. Like I, 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 I'll train heavy and like, I was always into like, just trying to, to maximize my output with bench and, and deadlift and squat and all those types of things. But like, I was like, you know, a long time ago advocating for mobility and it was a really hard sell amongst a lot of like athletes or amongst a lot of like bros, oh, especially and, and, bros, right? you know, they just like, what's the value in that? Like, cause <laughs> you look stupid. You look like it has nothing to do with the, voice, the voices that you make about this. It's 100% <laughs> accurate. Don't act like it's not like, what are you doing, bro? Yeah. <laughs> stupid. Right. And, uh, you know, and for me, it's like, okay, well, to your point, you're limited now and, and, and you're, you're limiting your strength potential because you're not putting the work in, uh, to, uh, strengthen it and stabilize around the joints. So your body feels like it's safe and, and able to, uh, supply your body well, with more force. It's, it's so like we, I mean, we obviously managing gyms, you see this all the time. We've all probably experienced it ourselves. I know I have, but I remember specifically, so I won't, I won't get too detailed cause I don't want to embarrass this person, but we have people come in and we film uh, workouts or exercises or programs using individuals uh, for these programs or workouts and stuff. I thought you were saying that like you're going to embarrass somebody who's in here. No, not in here. I feel like we bagged like, on this guy. I was guy like, a couple yeah. the fuck you going to say, bro, right no, now? No, it can only be me or Justin. <laughs> His name sounds like Schmadam. But anyway, no. This guy. <laughs> this we, we had somebody come in and we were filming some exercises, okay? And we were doing just a standard overhead shoulder press. Now, this person, they had great physique. They trained like a bodybuilder. They moved like a bodybuilder, though, the stereotype, right? Kind of stiff. They could not do a full extended, just a basic overhead press. By the way, when people get old, this becomes a problem. This yeah. person was, I believe, in their early 30s. Yeah. They looked like fit. tip-top shape. They could not do a full they're, extended. They were, in their, they were in their early 30s, and they were also a pro athlete, pro, yeah. pro C competitor on competitor, the stage, right? Yeah. They also couldn't do overhead tricep extension yeah. because their body limited them. Like that's the that's where the myth of muscle bound comes from. Because you would have people lifting weights, not training full ranges of motion, not training in different planes. And then what happens is their body limits them, limits them, limits them more and more and more to the to the areas that they train in. And they've got a lot of strength in those areas, but their body continues to limit them because it's scared of injuring, of, of them getting hurt, and it, mi and it minimizes their ability to progress. What's funny, too, is that individual who's trying to develop an incredible physique, if they started working on fully extending and worked on mobility, they what they would better, do, better physique. Yeah. They, they build more delts yeah. yep. as a mm -hmm. result of doing that. Yeah. I've also seen this with guys with, muscle with their shoulder press just going all the way down. Like, you know, they stop at the 90 degree, and then you tell them to come all the way down, they hurt their shoulder. Yep. Even going light, they yeah. say, "Oh, that hurts my shoulder." Like that's a that's a crappy place to be. Anyway, I got a, yeah. I got a, some some cool studies to bring up, and I found an older study because I was looking up studies on sleep deprivation 
and fat loss and diet and stuff like that. So there was a recent kind of meta analysis. There's some messed up studies on sleep deprivation, right? Oh, where they like really those push Russian it? studies. Oh, yeah. Yikes. those were. Have you heard of? Have you ever heard of those? No, like torture. Oh, yeah, basically, dude. yes. Like, well, that's what it is. So how they do a study on it? How they get that passed? Well, this is just. Testing it's like it. Soviet, like people are Soviet like, Union, obviously. Yes. Yeah, of course. Yes, that's so bro. fucked up. Yeah, they went oh. to the extreme with it, for sure. Yeah. Like, uh. no, the studies I'm going to talk about are like people who get you know like what's sad? Hours or five hours. What's sad yeah. about it? It's sad that I could guess that, but it's also like some of the best studies because they Dude. they have no morals. Dude. <laughs> they, can put, they would push the boundaries like it's that. It's terrible. It would yeah. give you- it, There's a there's a, there's a a story, and I don't, I don't know if it's true or not, but they tested extreme sleep deprivation. Um, on like uh, prisoners and stuff. And I think it's after, I want to say after five days or something like that of not sleeping and they would keep them up to see what would happen. So yeah. the person would try to fall asleep standing up and they'd keep them up. I believe after five days, if I'm not mistaken, a majority of people start to exhibit signs of uh, like clear schizophrenia. Like psych psychosis. Yeah, psychosis. Like you go crazy. Like you're totally sane. Mm -hmm. If we push this like five days, I remember it's something like 80% of people actually went crazy. Yep. They did one with a bunch of, I think there were like five people in there and uh, one of the people killed and eight yeah, the other people. Eight, and, like turn in, yes. It yeah, went crazy. Like really like dark. Almost like, uh, yeah, some what? zombie movie. <laughs> like yeah. crazy. What? It's a story. I don't know if it's true or not. I know. I've, said I've read the same legend. thing. So. You read the same? Yes. You and yes, I read the same I know. scary shit. So go into the study. Sorry. Yeah. I, so anyway, yeah, yeah, so sorry. there was a meta-analysis and what they found in the meta-analysis, and we know this, is that it, the, the, the body... When it lacks sleep, this is the theory, right? When it lacks sleep, and these people were not like the Soviet study. They were like, you couldn't sleep for five days. It was like they got six and a half hours of sleep a night. Like, you know, parents will do or people are under a lot of stress or right. whatever, right? Or even, they even included in this, that's why I like the study, um, like eight hours of sleep that wasn't good quality. So, so a lot of studies are on just the time. This one also looked at, these people are going to bed uh -huh. eight hours sleep, but they're not getting not all getting of, are, sleep. Yes. Are you familiar with this? So I've seen the studies and, and stats on that. I wish I re can recall what it was. Maybe you remember, but like, okay, so REM and deep are like the important yeah. two hour blocks that we're supposed to get. I think right? so. Yeah. I, I believe that's right. Right. Okay. Someone, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something like that. Right. That those are the two so most important blocks. Four hour REM and uh, two and two, oh, it's two, two and two, two, two yeah. REM, two deep, yeah. I believe is like the, is, and the, and the sweet number is like an hour and a half to two hours and anything less than that, like your, your risk of like cancer, your risk, like oh, yeah. your, like it's like it goes dramatically yeah. up once you get like like yeah. an hour. Like and I look at mine. Like there's a lot of times where I'm under two in those. It's an hour and a half. Even like, though you get you're in bed. Right, right. I only get an hour and a half or so of the of the. And you want to be like at least an hour and a half to ideally two or in the in those. And anything once you go from uh, one and a half hour less than that. Like I want to say an hour or less. It like dramatically increases the risk all, of all those. Oh issues. yeah, like well, a so, lot. So I'm not even going that far. And fact this, check me. Where I'm talking. Yeah, about. let's see what that is, Doug. In this study, the the um, the cravings that the people had from just not getting optimal sleep. So it's not like it's it's like like I said, it's a lot of people get sleep like this, six and a half hours. It's craving so coffee. bad, you'll we might crave people. Yeah. <laughs> No, hey, that's how far the cravings get. <laughs> Very much to the extreme. <laughs> the, scare, hey, the, the, the scare, proved it. scare everybody into sleep day, so bad. Day, day one. Yeah. Get yeah. your sleep. Yeah. Day one. Oh, I really we'll want donuts. Yeah. Day two. Oh, I kind of want soda and cake. Yeah. Yeah. Day, three. day three. Some day. human flesh yeah. sounds really good. Day Bob three. looks delicious. <laughs> Bob is looking really damn delicious right now. <laughs> I wish I knew that style. That's how I scare my clients into sleeping better. Hey, listen. listen. <laughs> you don't want cravings. No, 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 I'm good with cravings. No, listen, you want to eat your friends? Yeah. So anyway, they they the craving cravings went up dramatically and it was uh it was mostly for hyper palatable foods. So cravings went up but it wasn't for like healthy food, it was for comfort foods. And what's happening is the two reasons they think. One is those comfort foods make you feel temporarily better, so it's like a it's kind of like a drug. And the second reason is your body perceives a chronic kind of lack of sleep as a stress. And one of your safeguards against stress is gain body fat. Mm -hmm. Gain body fat yeah. so that if when the shit is the fan, pol policy. Yes. Yeah. Now this led me to finding another study which was fascinating. This study's over, I want to say over 13 years old, uh, old, but it was really interesting. So let me find this one. Why are you looking that up, Doug? Did you get me some facts over there, or Andrew? Do you yeah, I'm looking for uh, exact times. They give it more as a percentage of total sleep time. Uh, so deep sleep, for example, should be 10 to 20 percent of total sleep. Hmm. Uh, I believe REM is around the same amount, 20 25 percent. 
20, 20, well, 25% of eight hours would be two hours, right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so, so same difference. Right, right. Okay. All right. So check so, this but, but out. I what think I, uh, Cabral I, said, though, for deep sleep, he said you should hit around 70 minutes. I, I believe that's what he said. When well, he that, and that goes back to my point. It's an hour and a half to two hours is the range. Yeah. So that's like optimal is supposed to be an hour and a half to two of the two, the two blocks. I'm pretty yeah. sure of this. What I was looking for from you was a stat on if you get less than oh. that, how much that increases oh. your risk of cancer and, and other things. I forgot what it was. Was, but I had just recently read this, so it's interesting you went this direction, and I, it, it, I forgot to bring it up. It was in my notes to talk about it because I, I was so alarmed by the difference of just like 20, 30 minutes less of that deep mm. REM, how dramatic of a difference like it is. All-cause mortality yes, and markers. Yes, well, it, like, it went up like 50%. Mm. It was Listen, like a lot. I'm about to sell sleep right now because I when, I, heard that. when I read this study, I was like, oh, I can't believe I've ever heard of this. So they took groups of people, and this was a control. This is what I like about it. It was controlled. It was in a lab. And they control their calories, and they tested uh, weight, fat mass, lean body mass, okay? They took these individuals, and they did a phase of uh, eight and a half hours uh, of, in bed, which was on average about seven hours and 25 minutes of sleep, okay? okay? They also took the pe individuals, and again, control, 1,450 calories per day. They put everybody on a diet, okay? They took uh, another group, and they put them in uh, to sleep for five hours and 14, uh, 14 minutes, so... Roughly a two-hour difference in sleep. Now both groups lost the same weight. Okay, same amount of weight on the scale, but mm -hmm. trip off this. Right, one lost a lot of muscle. The 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 group that yes, the group that got the worst sleep, only one fourth of their weight came from fat. One fourth. Wow. wow. Three fourths came from muscle. Now wow. the other group, almost wow. half. Came from muscle, which it's, is okay, expected. Okay, so people have to. Wow. You, you have, now for us, that's obvious, right? We understand what, what that is. Yeah. It's like you're you're not getting the most important time when it comes to recovery and building muscle. And muscle is a very expensive tissue, and so the body is is getting the signal of like, oh, you're fucking me. You're not giving me the rest I need. I'm not able to prioritize. Let's make, this. Let's make ourselves harder or, or easier to survive in yes, a low more calorie resilient. stress environment. Right? And so it says, okay, let's pare down. Like so. So crazy. Look at the individuals who slept less than six hours, which is basically the thing that I'm saying, right? So if you're forty one percent higher risk of cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Forty one percent. But, I mean, but again, trip off this. The average person, if you just cut your calories, you don't lift weights, you don't eat high protein, you just cut your calories, you lose weight. Across the board, data shows forty percent of it will be muscle. That's expected. Okay. Now if you lift weights, eat protein, high protein, then you'll you'll you won't do that. But average person, that's what happens. If your sleep is bad, one fourth is fat. The rest is muscle. So now think of someone who's lifting weights, eating protein, they're doing everything right, they're on a calorie deficit, yeah, but, not but their sleep, sleep is crap. Yep. Yep. Now yep. you're screwed. <laughs> yeah. All from sleep. Right. All from sleep. So it's like the most anabolic or catabolic thing you could possibly do uh, has to do with your that's sleep. That's why I don't even consider supplements. I mean, that's your that's your key right there. I, ju I just had that conversation too. Who was that? It was somebody in my family that was asking about some latest supplement or like that. And I'm like, when was the last time you did like a real sleep analysis? Like checked like- yeah. I was going to ask you guys, because you 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 have the ring, right? Aura ring? I have the aura, but I also use the eight sleep. I was going to say, what was the difference before, after? Have you noticed improvements? And then what about when you're not in that bed? And you're at like we travel or something like that. What do you see? Well, it, it depends on what kind of bed I'm in, right? We tend to we tend to travel relatively nice, right? Okay. So we stay in like mm -hmm. nice beds and AC and all that stuff like that. Uh, so as long as I'm in a situation like that, like my sleep is okay or good, right? But the the eight sleep has been like night and day difference for me. If that's if I don't have that, like which I have, I've had it now for years, like. Me getting into a deep sleep and falling asleep is so much more difficult because I, my my temperature I get so hot so fast. Even if it's like cold out in the room, mm -hmm. my body heats up under the sheets, and then it'll wake me up sometimes where I'm I'm so warm I'm kicking off sheets, and then I don't sleep well if I don't have any how covers did, on me. How long does it take for the algorithm, the AI, to figure you out? Is it a week? That's a good question. I bet you could look up what they say, um, and it's always it adjusting. Is. Because your body changes. I'm trying to recall, like, I, it actually was, so I didn't know it was going to do that. So I didn't even know that. So I thought I was manually setting it. And then I remember one day um, I got on there because I, it didn't feel ice, ice cold. Like, so I had already set it, right? This mm -hmm. was like a couple weeks after we I had set it all up and I we had owned it. And, you know, the initial, like, when I first set it, I set it up as cold as you could possibly go. And that thing gets way colder than the, the Oolers get. And so it would be like a, like a fucking icebox. And I'm laying in bed one night, and I'm like, huh, it doesn't feel like an icebox. I'm like, I wonder if it's on. And I look down at the thing, and it's like, it was at a different temperature. And I was like, that's weird. 
I set it to lowest temperature. Why is it saying it's at minus four right now? It should be minus mm -hmm. eight or whatever the lowest setting is. And then I looked on it, and that's where I looked at the the looked into the AI thing. I thought, oh shit! It saw that you slept better it, on that. Yes, it uh. figured it out, and then now and and then I saw so I have yet to touch it or mess with it now, and now it's completely like molded wow. to my routine. What time I go to bed? How cold it needs to be? And what's cool about that was initially when I did it, I would just drop it as low as possible, and you know I'd be cold. There'd be like a little bit, but I'd rather be cold because then I know I would be all right through the night versus being at all borderline do you, hot. Do you know how it adjusts throughout the night for? you does it did you, are you able to look at a report to show that oh it goes it warms up here cools down here so i can see that although i have I, and i and i know i'm interested to see that i know enough that it's not what I, like so it, it starts off real cold right so i know it drops minus eight when i initially first get in it and then it slowly kind of brings me up in the middle of the night and then like and brings me up means like it's like minus two or minus one is like the warmest mm -hmm. it lets my bet get and then it actually goes down a little bit, I believe. That's like so weird. Yeah, it's yeah. A, yeah. And then and then it comes back up at the it's end. Cool. Of, so it's adjusting, morning. trying to get you to sleep better. Yeah. And and it's using because I of course I get up and go to the bathroom and it tracks your REM and deep sleep. And so it's figuring out like oh when we've put keep him at this temperature he gets this much more REM or this and then it and it you know keeps, when they if they can, if someone can design a, a bed for an infant that puts them to sleep and reads the baby because there's they have stuff now that's like really good. But it still doesn't like, it's not like a person to put them, that they'll become billionaires overnight. Cause it's, it is, <laughs> talk about loss of sleep. When you have a kid, a baby, you're not going to sleep. If there was a way you could put it on in the AI, no, oh, the cry's going here. Oh, move in position here. Do this. And then you just put them in. Oh, yeah, I wonder oh that, that would be a game. You know, I don't know if we'll ever get there. I'd just be worried there'd be a glitch or something. Well, like, I also, like the I also <laughs> think that, you know, we talk about this, right? With oxytocin. <laughs> we talk about this with like oxytocin know, and stuff yeah. like that. There's something about miss the, that bonding. Yeah. There's something about the human touch that, you know, that is very unique and special to a, a, a newborn. I don't know. I mean, this is. But it's torture. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I'm I, saying, I, my so my brother-in-law, he's his, he just found out his wife is pregnant, and he has his old his kid is how old is she now? Nine. So it's been a while, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I vaguely remember." I'm like, "Bro, you're in for it. You're not gonna get no sleep. You know, it no. lasts for a while." When you do a strength training exercise or when you lift weights, there's two general approaches. The first one is to focus on the movement, perfect the movement, feel the movement. The second one is to feel the muscle. Both of them have distinct advantages and disadvantages. Try them both in your training. Do you think do you think we're helping people or hurting them by telling them that? I sometimes, think sometimes I feel like that's like very confusing. No, well, let's talk about it. That's why we have a <laughs> that's why we have a podcast. <laughs> just, we don't just end it there, right? right? Yeah. A little bit further. Yeah. Well, okay, so uh, so a good example of movement uh focused strength training would be like a power lifter, right? Power lifter doesn't care about feeling the chest in a bench press or the quads in a squat. They're trying to maximize the biomechanics, trying to maximize the movement, lift as much weight as possible mm -hmm. in the safest way possible. Bodybuilders are an example of the other option. Um, bodybuilders could care less about how much weight is on the bar. When they do a bench press, they want to feel the pecs, um, you know, squeezing and contracting, getting a pump. When they do squats, they want to feel it in their target muscles, right? Both of them have yeah. advantages. Uh, one of them teaches you how to really fire the central nervous system. And if you're, especially if you've only been lifting for a few years, that's the way you activate the most muscle fibers. The other way is advent advantageous as well, because it teaches you how to sculpt the body, shape the body, identify weak areas. And it's also less uh, risk of injury when you yeah. work out that way. Totally competing goals though, or yes. competing mindsets, I should say. Yeah. It's interesting to think about that because, um, I mean, it, as you're doing, like, if you're just movement focused with that too, it's like, you're, you're, you're still confined to like perfecting that whole process. Mm -hmm. Like I want to, I want to be loose enough. I want to, I want to add as much force as possible in the right optimal time and then be able to relax my body and, and end up in a position that I'm seeking out. And so it's like a, it, to have like, you feel your muscles in that process would slow you down. It would kind of interrupt that whole flow. It's like a very like fluid mindset versus like the other is very much like let's hyper focus on every little thing, every little nuance that's happening mm -hmm. contraction wise with the muscles. Can I, can I feel this a little bit more intensively? Like bodybuilders do a really good job of making lightweight seem heavy. Yeah. I think I, that's a big thing. I feel like if you've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to work out with a power, a true power lift. There's someone who's been powerlifting most of their lifting career, right? 
uh, and then a, a true bodybuilder, somebody who's been training like a bodybuilder for most of their career, it's so obvious. So different. I mean, if, if if you've got somebody who maybe intertwines, go back and forth or, you know, lifts one way for a while, then changes is one thing. But if you like you ran the exact same workout, same exercises and you worked out with a power lifter and then you ran that back next week and you ran that with a bodybuilder, the experience of that workout would feel so different. Mm-hmm. You say it was, I, and you know, it's funny that, uh, this conversation is something that, that actually draws me back to Justin and I's when we first met, because I don't really work out with a lot of people like that. I've, I've talked about that so many times on the show. Like I'm the guy who doesn't like workout partners and, and never been a fan of that. You like that white snake song. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is that? Here Seen we go. Uh, again. Oh, <laughs> who's a? Hey, who's the chick that's dancing on the car on that one? Was oh, it Tori. Kim no, no, Tori what? something. No, that's someone else. Didn't yes, that right? Tori did that? Did, yes. okay, did that video make her famous, or was she famous? That video and that, made her famous. So the video made her famous. I, I'm almost was positive. she dating the lead singer, or was that just like a random like the their uh, producer or whoever? No like, idea. Sought her out. No okay. idea. I yeah. so picture Such like Doug and like a high school though. dance to that song. <laughs> <That's you. laughs> is that your high school, Doug? When you were is that close? How close am I? I don't know what year that is. Uh, Tawny, oh, Tawny Katane. Oh, Tawny. Dang. Tawny. That can't be a real name. 1989. Yeah. Where are you at? Where Every, are you at? Everybody's got a watch. 1989, I was, uh, I, was, I graduated by university by then. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was still, you were still, it was still yeah. relevant. Yeah. Right? Well, no, he graduated, so it hadn't even come out. Oh, the so he was, he was dancing no, I'm, something I'm, I was even old older. Yeah. Wow, I was, trying to, I was trying to hook you up there. <laughs> I was trying to hook you up for a couple of years there. I was uh, dancing to Count Basie Band. <laughs> no, you <were. laughs> The who? Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. All right, all right. Take it back. Take it back to what you were saying. But so Justin was one of the few people that I, I probably went through a stint that I lifted with pretty consistently. And it was always interesting to watch how different we did every ex- exercise. Because yeah. you were bodybuilder folks. Yeah, to- yeah. I, yeah, I was totally bodybuilder. And yeah. and I would I would even categorize me as like the extreme version of that. In fact, I remember getting introduced to training that way. And I used to I used to like the point that Justin made right there. I was like, I used to like to use the lightest weight, yeah. but make it heavy, right? And because I cared just about the way I looked, that was like the thing. It was like I loved pulling up next to a powerlifter guy who's Whoa, moving all his weight, grunting yeah. and slamming and making big noise. And then I'd come over with my little itty bitty weight, but then I would be jacked, yeah. you know, all well, shredded. So you used to get excited when uh I mean you'd bury me in some of these like hypertrophy yeah. workouts. Yeah. <laughs> so you feel like okay, now we're a superset. That was my hack. Right? I never superset anything before that. You know, it was just <laughs> all just like hundred percent like max effort, <laughs> yeah. like with, with each lift. You remember but, that remember that workout we had with uh Ben Pikulski at his gym? Yeah. <laughs> And he took all three of us through a workout. I've never, I think that's kept, the most so awkward. awkward I think that's the most awkward I've ever seen Justin. He kept correcting Justin's form. Uh, yeah, because like, Justin's not a bodybuilder. I was like, I'm pretty sure we're gonna get in a fight if this keeps going. He this kept way. going over. He's no, just no, like grab my arms here. and like yeah. moving them. Yeah. It's like, oh god, yeah. you, you gotta know. feel it right here. Feel yeah. this area. Justin's like, oh god, this is terrible. But I mean, this it's this is important to understand about strength because they both have so much value. Like, if you look at the studies on activating muscle fibers, okay. You will activate more muscle fibers if you fire the whole body. And that's what movement-based training um, tends to do, right? So when you bench press like a power lifter, what do they focus on? Leg drive, activating the lats, like all these muscles in order to, to generate this neural drive that helps you lift the most weight. Bodybuilders are like, flare your elbows out, feel your pecs squeezing at the top, feel the stretch you know, at the bottom type of deal. Now, as you become more advanced you can activate more muscle fibers without having to fire the whole central nervous system. So, so when you see these like really advanced lifters and they can really turn on a muscle without activating too many of the other muscles, that's a skill that's developed. But they're both valuable. Like I like when yeah. you switch to powerlifting style training, you probably saw new muscle growth. Yeah, yeah. You know, and Justin, probably when you went to hypertrophy. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah, so it's like these two these two paths are not it's not like you have to stay in one or the other. You, you should focus on both of them. And, and I would even make the argument that powerlifters would would gain value from doing some hypertrophy. In fact, I don't need to make hundred percent. They know that now. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I, you know, I, the part that the original point I made about, are you know, are we just confusing people more? I do think that this sheds a little bit of light on sometimes when you see these different uh, pieces of content that go viral, that also as a consumer becoming aware of who's presenting that information, yeah. right? Like there's like, there's been many times where like, you know, our, our good friend Jordan Shallow will put something out and it will sound like it's countering something that we're talking about. It's like, well, no, that he's, he's coming from a different philosophy of lifting. It's not necessarily that it's right or wrong or my way's right, his way's wrong. It's just that depending on your pursuit and your way of training, 
it can determine how that piece of content is is interpreted. And so the yes. average person sometimes doesn't understand how to do that. It turns into like, oh, well, he says this. Well, it's like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, that that's yeah. true, but this is also true. Speaking of which, his certification is one of the only ones. Uh, there's very few certifications that really tackle workout programming in a way where I'm impressed to his, the physiological level. Yeah. Like he, he really, cause workout programming, there's a lot of nuance. Yeah. Uh, there's, you know, depending on who you're working with and the client and you know, you know that really it could, it could vary so greatly on how you would program a workout. And there's so many moving parts. Um, his, his is one of the better ones where well, you look at it. Actually, I would say one of the best ones where you look at how they taught, they teach programming, like how to construct effective workouts they do a really good job he's one of the only ones i know too that has sort of a, a living breathing course that that they constantly change based on current research yes and, and he's always addressing that uh with these group calls and and you know informing all the coaches and he keeps it like super super current like a lot of these other certifications are, are kind of dinosaur these days well there's a reason why he's been accepted into these circles like the nfl and the nba like I mean, he's every time I look up, he's at another like NBA camp, NFL camp, working with some pro athlete. Like, I mean, he's definitely he's he's moving around in very respected circles like that. Just a little bit about my background here is that I'm sitting around 140 pounds. I've uh, been working out for the last 15 years or so. I uh, started with Beachbody, got it really into their programs, added some running. So I've done about six half marathons. Uh, so I love, you know, doing some long distance running. Uh, I unfortunately had to stop that because I had some bad hip flexor and leg issues and just, I think, age in general. Um, so then Beachbody, I feel like was really good because it got me to love working out. Um, I started doing a lot of cardio with that and then transitioned to more of the weights, weight slash cardio stuff uh, within the last year. I found another person, um, just an influencer. She uh, <clears throat> was married to one of the trainers that I followed on Beachbody, and she is all about women getting strong. That everybody, you know, everybody should lift. Uh, she preaches protein, you know, just right up your alley. Um, so I did see some changes with my body comp, um, but I've recently started gaining a little bit of weight in my midsection. Uh, I am 47, uh, full menopause. Uh, so I started taking some hormone replacements because that was just really throwing my body off. Uh, so I've been feeling a lot better with that. So within the last uh, couple weeks, I've really been focusing on protein intake. So I've been taking about or I've been eating consistently about 130 calories. You know, some days it might be Grand. 120, 140, 50. Um, and then uh, so I've been lifting. Uh, I'm eating a, a now I'm eating about uh, 1,700 calories, but I mean, when I first started, it was probably about 1,200 calories and then 1,500. And then I've just sort of been, you know, listening to you guys increase my calories. Um, and then uh, I've been taking creatine for the last couple months now. Um, so my goal is to get some rid of some of the fat uh, that I've, you know, gained a little bit. Uh, so I do work out around five o'clock in the morning. You know, I get myself ready, get my kids ready, go off to school, and then I don't eat until about 8 o'clock, so 8 a.m. So um, my questions are, is not eating before the workout causing me not to gain the muscle that I want? Um, I do drink some on the weekends, not excessively and not every weekend, but is that causing me to gain some weight? And then I've also been looking at some of your programs and which ones would you suggest? Um, since this question was put in, I uh, did buy the anabolic. I've been doing following that for the three days, and I am currently just started phase three. Awesome. Okay. Are you are you doing anything in addition to MAPS anabolic? Um, I've been trying to do some stretches. Uh, I've been trying to get my steps. Um, I've been, I'm probably about 8,000 a day, mm -hmm. um, okay. sometimes more. Um, but I've been, that's at least my goal. I'm trying to increase that slowly. So. Mostly walking. Are you walking? Is that how you're getting your steps? Yes. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You're, you're, you're doing a lot. Yeah. You're doing a lot better. of the right stuff. Yeah. You, you really are. Um, with as far, uh, let me answer that question about the food part. Okay. okay. 
usually it doesn't make a difference. Now, if you're noticing kind of a stress response, cortisol elevated, sometimes functional medicine practitioners will recommend that a person either have something right when they wake up, or in your case, you wake up so early, I do the same thing, I wake up at five. They would recommend having something small right after the workout, just to just to uh, you know, kind of get the cortisol to come down a little bit, but it's probably not making that big of a difference. Um, do you do you, now? You said you're on hormone therapy. How long have you been on that? Um, probably about six months now. Okay, and has that made a big difference? Are you progesterone, estrogen, or just progesterone? Both estrogen and progesterone. Um, I was getting hot flashes, yeah. brain fog, couldn't remember crap. I mean, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so I started that hormone replacement, and that has just helped make me feel so much better normal anyway you you're doing a lot of the right stuff yeah, so much so that i'd actually be concerned about adjusting too much without actually getting like yeah. a body fat test yeah. i would love to because you, got, you got, keep in mind a couple things going on here right like uh you've re you've cut out all the running you used to do so now you've switched that with walking you're following a two to three day a week program you've increased calories um, also full blown menopause going on right now. So there's a lot of things that are going on and you're doing a lot of the right things. Yeah. You're doing what I would do with you. If Ex you were exactly. Mind. So what I would be worried about is to say, Oh, just because maybe you feel like you're carrying a little bit of extra body fat without knowing for sure what happened to the body fat, you know, say a month ago to mm -hmm. compare today, um, you might be right on the right track. So that would be really helpful and useful. You know, it'll get. help actually, Bethany. Um, <clears throat> let's see over uh, when were you at 1200 calories? How long ago? Probably, last, probably this time last year. So it's been about a year of slowly bumping up to about 1,700 and then increasing protein? Yes. Okay. Um, how do you feel now in comparison to before? Forget the the body fat and all that stuff. Like Workout-wise, mm -hmm. strength. Do you, are you like, is, how, how much has your strength gone up? Do you feel more energy? Is, is your sleep better? Like, Are all those signs pointing in one direction or another? Yes, I have been. I mean, I sleep. I sleep well. Um, while I was well, before the hormone therapy, I was waking up okay. all, a lot at night, um, so that's really helped a lot. I think the food increase has helped quite a bit. Um, when I was at the twelve hundred calories, I was eating quite uh, quite a bit. It's probably the same amount of protein, but I was just the calories were just so low. Yeah. Um, you know, real low fat um, chicken breast and ground turkey mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So. Um, I've switched, uh, some of that up and, you know, I'm close to hundred or 1700 calories now and really haven't gained any weight. Um, yeah, I but I do feel a lot better. Oh, I, you're, I, yeah. I think no. you're, you're crushing. Right, right. It out. So what yeah. I would love to do, Bethany, for you, since you're at the phase three of anabolic is mm -hmm. give you another program to, uh, after, after this finishes that you can follow. What I would love is a body fat test now and another one in four weeks. Like that okay. would be that would and I would I would still want you to continue to slowly bump your calories. Yeah, I think I wouldn't want to change. I don't want to change anything until I have that last number because everything you're saying is is telling me that you're actually doing really good. Yeah. You're you're moving in the you're right direction. Right yeah, yeah, you're doing great. And you you said your body weight's 140. How tall are you? Uh, five three. And your how's your strength uh, with maps anabolic? Do, you, do you, what, what were you working out with with like like your squats and deadlifts and let's say phase one? Um. Well, I was doing. <laughs> Squats probably, which I, I'm real cautious about that because I've sure. got I've had some lower back pain. Um, so um, I have one of those like old style powerhouse um, like rack things at home. Yeah. Um, so putting, I, I think I was up to about 80 pounds on the squats, and then deadlift I was probably about 95, I okay. think. So okay, and, um, and you're feeling stronger. You're you're seeing your strength go up. I am. Slowly, oh. but yeah, you're I mean, doing, but I've also been lifting for probably year, year and a half. Yeah, you're, right do, you're doing good. Yeah. I, and I would slowly, slowly <laughs> increase your calories. Let's get you to, you know, over 222, 2300 calories doing what you're doing now. And then from there, okay. you have a lot of flexibility. Yeah, let, let, let's set, let us set you up with a program. Let's go get a body fat test as soon as we we can right now, like in the next week or so. And then again, mm -hmm. in four, in four weeks, also we'll have Doug put you in the private forum. And then you can give okay. us uh, an update in four weeks, because I, okay. I I think we are. I see, sounds like we're all on the same page here. Of like I think everybody's like fearful to change anything because yeah. I think what you're doing is actually really good. I just okay. think we need to get a little bit more data on exactly what's happening because you might just be. And this is always hard, by the way, for clients. You've probably heard me or us talk about this on the podcast. Is 
you're like in that Goldilocks zone yeah. where you're really not moving a lot in any direction. Your body weight's kind of staying the same, but you're gradually getting stronger. So you're gradually building a little bit of muscle. You're also slowly losing a body fat. So you're not seeing major changes, but actually a lot is happening in the positive direction. And so I don't think any of us want to overcorrect you until we get a little bit more information. Well, just to give you an idea, uh, Beth, when you were eating 1200 calories, were you running and doing like more workouts and stuff at that time? So yeah. consider this, you were working out a lot more before trying to burn a ton of calories and eating 500 less calories a day. Right. Today you're eating 500 more calories, working out less and you feel better. You are, you're doing phenomenal. Yeah. You're doing really, really okay. well. Like, yeah, if you were my client, I'd be super like excited about this and yeah. really you, you just stay the course and you're going to continue to see yourself feel better and change in a very sustainable way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, you guys talk all the time about um, just increasing those calories so that you can have a day every once in a while yeah, to right. enjoy. Um, Cause before I wasn't, I wasn't getting that. Were you bumping your, did you bump your fats uh, with, uh, with your new, with your new calories? Cause it, yes. Good. Yeah. When mm -hmm. women eat low fat, it, it wrecks their, mm -hmm. just, just overall how they feel. And it's one of the first things I would do with a client. I look at their diet. Their fat <laughs> intake was low. I bump their fat intake, and it would change things. So you guys think forty plus? Maybe I was just going to ask you, what do you think should we do for the next so a fo as a follow up? Because she's kind of already doing that, but the the, the lifestyle guides. Like, I like the forty plus. We'll, we'll yeah, we'll that's a great program. Define it a bit further. Either that or symmetry. I thought yeah, symmetry, symmetry too. Right, I didn't yeah. want to send her back on the isometrics right now. I, I wanted to kind of keep her ramping up. I think so forty plus. I, I like forty plus, and then the forum. Yeah, That's we're good. gonna we're gonna send you a program. We'll put you in the forum, and then let us know. Yeah, like follow up with us, Beth. Love to hear okay. about how yeah. things are going. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Awesome Thank you guys. Yeah, Thank you. Job. Great All job. Right. Really appreciate it. You Thank it. you for everything you do. Thank you. That's good. S such a great example of. Um, yeah. You know, someone who's doing a really good job, but can, how we they can get question our, how, how we can get in our head. Yeah. yeah. You know, and what it is, is that you just, you don't see that scale moving. Maybe you don't even feel like you see your body changing much in the mirror, but the, what she's saying, just like you pointed out, eating 500 more calories, not moving running anymore, less. moving, moving yeah. less, having the ability she's to have flexible strides. weekends and yeah. have drinks on the weekend mm -hmm. and not feel like any, yeah. anything's getting stuck. I mean- Doing really, really good. You know, it's funny is I would have clients like this and they, you know, get in their own head and then they come to me at some point and say, I just ran into somebody I haven't seen in six months and, and they, they asked me, them. yeah, they said, wow, you lost 15 pounds. And it's like, the scale hasn't moved. I'm like, well, I'm telling you, yep. body composition's changed. That, that makes such a difference that I actually used to, that was part of the advice, right? So if I had someone like her and if she hears this, go do this, go find somebody who hasn't seen you in the last year and see what they say yeah. like, mm -hmm. and just go run, f old family, old friend, yep. somebody who hasn't seen you in like a year and tell me that they don't make a comment on yeah, how yeah, good, good you reassurance. Yes. Sure. Cause Why are people saying I lost weight. Yeah. 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 Or just that you look great. Yep, you know yep. what I'm saying? It's like, you just sometimes need to hear that from somebody like else. Your girl voice that you do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. That's great. Our next caller is Marshall from Florida. Marshall, what's up, man? How can we help you? What's up, buddy? What's up, boys? Good morning. Yeah, well, happy Ash Wednesday, by the way. Uh, thanks, buddy. You too. Yeah, thank you. What's going on? How can we help you? Uh, so, my question was, back in November, I wrote you guys. Um, I had started doing a different programming. It was full body, two days a week. Um, more of like a powerlifting um, workout. and I was noticing that uh, I was getting really sore after my squat days, more so than like running a MAPS pro program. So really what I'm wondering is, is it due to maybe a over intensity or could it be more of a recovery uh, problem that I'm having? Uh, I mean, it's both, both, I guess the same thing. Um, intensity is usually the first place we would look if mm -hmm. this was the case volume being this kind of second thing. What's different. What is different about the workout now when you squat? Yeah. Are you doing more what's sets? the sets and reps look like? Are you training you? to yeah. failure? Like what's the difference in the load? So on that program, I, it was more like a traditional five by five. Um, it, I was starting out at. 60% of my max 
like in week one. Um, and then it progressed each workout, right? Um, each workout would go up 5%. The only difference being on that fifth set, it was, it was like a, a burnout set to that. That was more of the gauge to, um, see my progress from week to week and that's the one so, that made you really sore marshall yeah, marshall are, yeah. are you not you're obviously not running one of our programs yeah, yeah it doesn't sound familiar so now i am i've ran y'all's <laughs> programs in the past i have rgb um i i did that because well for one i've, I've never ran a, a any kind of power lifting or real like a strength you wanted pace. you wanted to see if the grass was greener on the other side Mm. Pretty much. Yeah. How'd that go? How'd that go for you? Tank. How'd that go for you? Yeah. So the soreness is not fun. Um, <laughs> it's fake grass. I'm, <laughs> so I'm back on. I'm back on anabolic <laughs> now. Grass. Good. And I will say, um, whenever I miss a workout or two uh, due to life circumstances, you know, when I do come back and and uh, get back to it. I'll still see that soreness even when I just miss a workout or two. So that's normal. That's, that's normal. Yeah. This is why you've, and I've talked about this on the podcast many times, like it's still to this day. Uh, in fact, we brought it up just the other day again. Uh, when I miss a, a couple days or a week off of training and I come back, I always overestimate what I need to do intensity wise. And it's always blows my mind. Yeah. Like I, after the workout, even with all my experience, I go, Jesus, I could have, could have just done two sets and walked away and been plenty yeah. good, but I do more because I think I'm fine. And that's a lesson that you're going to continue to learn until you understand that when you, when you have a few days off like that, again, it doesn't take much to send that signal again. So you just got to do, you do half the volume or half the intensity and because you can always ramp it up the following week. And so you're just, you're overreaching every time you, you get back to your lift and you, and you don't need to yeah. do that or deal with the soreness. I mean, uh, it, that's, but that's normal. You take some time off. The soreness is worse when you come back, even if it's just a week or, or a few days, that's, that's totally normal. Now if it persists, so that is normal. Yeah, it's totally normal. Mm -hmm. If it persists, uh, then you, then we, we got to look at your programming. It is, it is normal, but I also want to point out, it's also a, a indicator that you did more than you need to. And so in this Sal, what Sal's saying is, yeah, you just, it's normal. It happens to everybody. We yeah, can you work still, through You still want to cut down. Yeah, yeah, nothing. But I mean, that should always be this reminder to you. And I, and the reason why I share that on the podcast that like with all of our knowledge and experience, I still do that shit to myself. So that's how normal it is, but it doesn't okay. mean it's right. Right. So like yeah. so the, the, the self-talk I have afterwards is God damn it. Yeah. I should know better. I didn't need to do that. Right. But it, it's not, I like guess, a, um, if sorry to interrupt, but I guess, um, a question that kind of naturally leads out of that to your point is, you know, and you guys have talked about, it's also normal for, you know, life just to happen mm -hmm. yeah. and you might miss a week. Yeah. So at, it's almost as if inconsistency is the norm. Yes. Uh, to an extent. Um, so how am I supposed to expect to make gains if inconsistency is the norm? Listen, we did, we, we shared us. You ever hear us talk about the study where the, the two groups, you had somebody who the, they went for like 18 weeks. They trained every single week for 18 weeks. Mm -hmm. And there was another group that every, every fourth week they took that entire week off. And at the end of that study, the people that took the week off every fourth week got the same results as the group that went every single week all the way through 18 weeks. Yeah. So the the slight interruptions here and there are are not that as big of a deal as people you, make it. Now, you, you breaks for, you know, months. weeks. Yeah, weeks straight, three you, weeks in a row. You can also do this, Marshall. It's like, oh, man, I can't go do my normal workout. All I have is 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Do a 15 minute workout or a 10 minute something, right? Or yeah, I ended up doing that last night. Um, That's it. I had a long day yesterday, got back home. We actually just bought a nice little uh, workout rack with all the essentials uh, about a week ago. So last night it was late. I didn't get to the gym, but I worked out at home and did just the foundational lifts and that was it. That's great. Yeah, you um, got it. Okay. Something's better than nothing, right? So, do you, do you oh, have yeah. MAPS 15? Because that program is just incredible for stuff like this. Yeah, I do. And um, I put my wife on that actually yeah. because she's uh, postpartum right now. So I thought that'd be, be good, good for her. Be good for you too. Do the advanced yeah. version. Yeah. Watch what happens. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think too, like um, in terms of like when you go back to to lifting to Adam's point, like the the mentality of of uh, tapering that down and like really just being disciplined with doing less than what you think um, you, you want to, to to really jump back in full force like you were doing. You need to be able to taper that down so you can build upon that again. It doesn't matter if it feels like it's like you're you're backtracking. You're not actually backtracking because now you're. You're giving yourself the right stimulus. So it's all about the right dose in order to kind of keep pushing you forward. So, you know, if you if you hammer yourself too hard, you're going to have this excess amount of time to recover. And, and the, the soreness itself, um, you know, we can address that. But, you know, to find that sweet spot, you're always trying to find that sweet spot, that right dose for you. Uh, so that way, you know, frequency is going to be more likely. Uh, because, you know, these interruptions are going to happen, yes, but um, if you're not getting in the way of that with restricting your movement because of soreness with, you know, all these kind mm -hmm. of patterns, like you're going to feel more energized. And this is like a snowball effect that you can build off of. So it's it's a totally different men like mindset, but you got to start training yourself mentally to do that. Yeah, it's definitely a hard uh, mindset to adopt after, you know, being raised up to think like soreness is the the, yeah. the pinnacle, defining right? factor yeah. totally i know that now it's that's not but even still just to come into the workout and you know kind of just remind myself like hey you missed a week so we need to dial it down that's and it. even during the workout it doesn't feel like i'm doing a lot right. already mm -hmm. just to that point so 100%. Um, you you don't lose strength in a week, but you do cause more damage on the comeback workout. Well, especially so, right. where, where it becomes super detrimental is when you have that hard workout and then you don't want to lift the next day because you're so sore. Like, so th that's kind of how I try and get myself in the right mindset is like, yeah. uh, so what yesterday, your next day I lifted like? yesterday and I hadn't lifted it almost a week. Right. So yesesterday's workout as I'm training, the things I'm thinking is like, I want to lift today. Right. So I'm the, the tomorrow is what I'm thinking yesterday. And so as I'm going through these lifts, I'm going like, I don't want to go too much because then if I go really bad, I'm going to not want to lift tomorrow. And I care about the consistency of getting back into it. Right. So that's kind of what you're you're telling yourself as you're going through it. And you think, oh, I could easily do another set or I could easily add more weight. It's like, yeah, but I don't need to. And I'm going to lift tomorrow and I don't want to be so damn sore that I don't want to lift tomorrow. So I need to back off. And you can always add later on. Like, so but you know how you know the thing we always say, right, do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. So that's the mindset. Mm hmm. All right, man. Good stuff. Thanks, All right, Marshall. Thanks for calling in, bro. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for your time. Yep. You got it. All right, dude. Soreness is definitely a sign <clears throat> that you don't want to ignore. The The problem is that soreness, uh, that people think that soreness is a sign of a good workout. Yeah, right. They're misreading the sign. It is not a sign of a good workout. That's still it's a, a big a big thing. It's you a know, sign a that you might have done that. too much. Yeah. Well, and it, and it, we're really... The, and he didn't get into it. I, I, I alluded to it, but he didn't get into it. But what happens a lot of times with these people is they go off for a week. And by people, I mean all of us, right? So you go off for like a week and then you come back and you're like, oh, I've been off for a week. You got to make up for it. Yeah, you got to make up for yeah. it. Yeah. And then get after it. And then because you got after it so much, either one, you don't even lift the next day or the two days after like that. Or even if you do lift, you're going to have to like gingerly go through it because you're so sore from the previous workout. So you end up doing, you end up doing half the volume that you could take and then the body's still sore. So it's, it's just trying to recover. Like, so That's it. Yeah, you don't realize how much you shoot yourself in the foot by overreaching that much consistently. And, you know, again, we I know people are tired of hearing the do as little as possible to listen amount of change. But that's the reason why I say it so much is because I get what a challenge this is. I'm getting yeah. that tattooed on my butt. The more advanced you become with strength training, the more experience you get, the better results you can get with light weights. It's true. This is why bodybuilders, advanced bodybuilders can work out with weight that you tend to think, that looks light. How are they so big? Well, it's because they can activate more muscle fibers with light weight. In other words, they can use light weight and get the effects that it would take someone else to get from heavy weight. This is true. So keep at it with strength training. Eventually, you'll be able to use lighter weight and get better results. This uh, tip really hits home for you, huh? <laughs> Stop. Why? Yeah. Why? Because I use lightweight? Just do your, your, yeah, your lightweight uh, tendencies. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's it, it's true. It's something, yeah. too, that I, what's funny, and Adam not being here to represent his uh, advice to me, but yeah. uh, this was one of those things that uh, he used to take me through bodybuilder workouts and would pick weights for me. 
and would just kind of tell me to hold it in certain positions yeah. and then squeeze and feel. And I'm like, what? Like that was my first exposure to not just like seeking the, the heaviest thing and trying to just, you know, destroy myself every workout. Yeah. You know, this is, I mean, body, the more advanced you become, the more effective, uh, you are at summoning muscle fibers, right? So when you're start, just getting started with strength training and you're lifting a weight, your body will recruit so many muscle fibers and the heavier the weight or the, the harder the exertion, the more muscle fibers you recruit. So heavy weight becomes something that's very effective way to build muscle and strength. But as you become more advanced, you can learn how to do this with lighter weight. And this is why you see advanced lifters, you know, in the gym where you look at them and you go, man, that guy's so big or they're so muscular, but they're using such light weight. And you'll hear, Bob, you know, you'll hear bodybuilders say things like, well, you got to, you know, I can feel the muscle, I can target it or whatever. What's happening is they're able to activate the same amount of muscle fibers with lighter weight because they've learned how to do so through experience. Now, this is important information because when you first get started with strength training, the best results you'll get will come from getting stronger, period, end of story. Like for the first probably three years of training, maybe longer for some people, like that should be your goal. Let's just get stronger. Let's do it in a smart way, right? Let's train with good technique, good form, good stability, but let's continue to get stronger. That's where you're going to get the best, best results. But you can't obviously keep getting stronger forever. If that were the case, you know, Justin and I'd be lifting thousands of pounds, right? Easily. <laughs> but that's not the case. Um, but what ends up happening is you can make lighter weight far more effective. Um, and a lot of it is the you're just the connection that you have to the exercise and how you can essentially create the same level of tension with lighter weight. And this is a skill that takes time to develop. Yeah. If, and I would say too, like it's very valuable uh, as like I got new clients um, and I'm trying to teach, you know, the mechanics and uh, really try to teach that slow controlled uh, stability and, and tempo and, um, you know, to be able to also increase difficulty by mm -hmm. uh, adding like certain uh, isometric holds and positions and really connect that mind muscle connection there uh, in terms of the recruitment process. So uh, again, this is an, another kind of area I think a lot of people overlook and, and kind of bypass really quickly because they want to get to uh, the amount of weight that they're, um, they're trying to always kind of increase weight or get to the results and kind of just jump into like the, the really difficult workouts where, you know, taking your time to learn that process of, of muscle recruitment, uh, and really connecting to m muscles individually is super valuable. Yeah, to give a good example of what I'm talking about. It's like when you first start strength training or after a long break, you'll notice when you do an exercise that you might even feel shaky. You remember that when you were a kid, you start lifting yeah. and you do the bench and it'd be like, uh, it's almost like your muscles are laughing yeah. and it's a little shaky. And then as you warm yeah, up or whatever, in front of you, it starts, yeah, it starts to get smoother, uh, as you lift the weight. Um, that's, uh, because your CNS is connecting, becoming more efficient, um, and essentially activating, uh, muscle fibers more effectively. Um, and again, as you become more experienced through years of training, you know, I could take, I could take a, a 135 pounds and do a row. And if I wanted to, I could make it really feel like 300 pounds. I really could, mm -hmm. but I couldn't do that as a kid. The only way I could do that as a kid working out was go, try to go real slow or try to, you know, make the reps look a certain way. But now I can actually just squeeze and do that. Another example is how a power lifter with a lot of experience can prime everything they need to by simply warming up on the bench press, right? So yeah, you'll hear some power lifters or strength athletes criticize priming, right? Correctional exercise or priming. And they'll say, just do squats to warm up for squats or just do deadlifts to warm up for deadlifts. The problem is for a lot of people is they're not able to properly prime and position themselves by doing that specific exercise. You have to pick other exercises that allow them to target the areas that they need to connect to to eventually get to the deadlift, then do a couple they sets of They haven't learned the right uh, muscle recruitment sequence. That's right. Now you watch a power lifter, watch a power lifter who could bench press 500 pounds, watch them warm up uh, with 135 pounds. And what you'll see is them priming their mid back, their lats, they're mm -hmm. squeezing the bar, they're tucking the elbows, they're driving with their, even though it's 135 pounds, they can lift 500 pounds. Yeah. I mean, they could throw 135 through the roof if they wanted to, but what you'll see is they're priming their entire body. The average person can't do that. The average person doesn't know what that feels like. And so, uh, that they have to do is they have to do specific priming exercise, but then over time, 
you develop that skill. It's very similar to what I'm talking yeah. about with bodybuilders. Well, I mean, just as an example, like I, I always am impressed uh, when I see somebody deadlifting, they take that time to engage their lat. Yes. That is so rare. And it's such a, um, you know, when, when you look at that in terms of like uh, form and, and mechanics and technique, like, you know, when you get all the pieces stacked together and, and you take that time to adjust and get yourself, um, you know, like fired up and get all the right muscles ready to go, like it, it, what a difference that makes in overall performance. Yeah. Now, and, and another reason why this is valuable is at some point in your training, and again, this takes years, at some point in your training, adding 15 pounds to the bar, the risk to reward ratio is not favorable, right? So- you know, if you're if you're out there and you're you're a guy and you're starting to squat, you know, to go to go from a hundred pound squat to let's say a three hundred pound squat, like that's great. You're gonna get phenomenal results. But after for some people three hundred pounds, for other people maybe four hundred pounds or higher, like going up fifteen pounds now, the risk is so high and the reward is so low in comparison. Like it makes no sense. Like I went through this recently. Uh, it was I don't know how long ago. It was eight months ago when I hit a, a PR in deadlifts. Six hundred five pounds is what I pulled off the floor. Now, I thought to myself, I wonder if I could get up to 650, but the rewards from that would be so minimal and the risk is just through the roof. Like if the bar moves the wrong way, you know, a half an inch, I'm going to hurt myself and it could be a really bad injury. Yeah. Instead, what I could do is lighten the load and really focus on making the weight feel heavier. So now the risk is low, but the rewards are still very high. So I changed. But when I first got started, it was it was far better off to go from 135 to 300 pounds. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So it's all about that. In fact, that's how I'm training now. I, I train a lot this way where if you see me working out now, and I, I run into a lot of people at UFC gym. That's right where I go at the moment. If you see me working out now, I'm more often than not uh, taking weight off the bar. I'll start yeah. with a certain weight. I'll do a set, and then you'll see me take weight off because I'll be like, I wonder if I can make this set feel heavy if I have heavier or just as effective, if I take 20 pounds off yeah. and then I'm able to do it. And what's happening is I feel better. Uh, it's give, giving me better results, but I would have never, that would have never worked for me in my, you know, teens and twenties when I first started working out where the best thing to do was just to get stronger. Yeah. You know, you know where else I really like this. I believe it's the overcoming isometrics. Oh where yeah. It, the thing is like to be able to stretch your capacity for muscle recruitment and to, to get the, like the loudest signal possible. Like you can apply that to lightweight. You can apply that to even barely any weight, but you pushing against or pulling against an immovable object, yes. uh, which totally translates to then going back to um, that kind of load demand. So, um, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can, you can get that same, you can generate that same kind of power and strength and force without all the risk and the damage. Uh, by the way, I mean, just thought, just, you know, on that topic, uh, overcoming isometrics. So just to kind of break it down for people that know, that would be like me getting under a bar, like I'm going to do a squat, and let's say I position the bar so it's almost like I came out of the hole. So I'm not at the full bottom squat. I'm kind of up a little bit, but it looks like I'm about, you know, I just started the rep. And I'm sitting under the bar, and the bar is, let's say it's loaded with weight that I could never lift, or it's it's pushing up against chains that are, you know, bolted to the floor. And then I squat, and I push into this bar that there's no way I can lift. And so I just push as hard as I can, maintaining good technique and good form. That's what overcoming isometrics is. Yep. Studies show that that activates the most muscle fibers. That type of a rep will get, because you because what happens is you're trying to lift the weight, you're trying to lift the weight, yep. it's not happening, so the body goes 90% muscle yep. fibers. Give uh -oh. them more, give them 95, more. 98, 99, and then you know, obviously you still don't move it. That's a great way, by the way, if you're an advanced lifter, if you want to uh, get everything activated before you go into your lifts, do a couple of those, then go do your regular workout. Oh yeah, and it will. Now I don't know about doing it every time you work out, no. but uh, you know, God, I've I've messed with that, and it's weird how you feel with the sets afterwards, the traditional sets uh, afterwards. It's yeah. like, what's happening? It's I feel just like, like I just got boom. You get it's just that response is almost immediate. Yeah, because everything's turned on. Yeah. Everything's ready to go. Yeah. yeah. I really need your guys' help. I'm a 39 year old female. I'm 5'7", 140 pounds, approximately 22 percent body fat. Um, I've been lifting for nine years consistently, 
I started my lifting journey after I lost 100 pounds, and I lost 100 pounds through just cutting my intake. I didn't do anything drastic. I just cut portion sizes, and I started riding a stationary bike. Um, through this, um, I, I obviously lost 100 pounds, but I also greatly improved my overall health. But I looked really flat. Like, I almost looked unhealthy. So I started resistance training to try to improve the way my body looked and feel more confident in my skin. Um, I've done a series of bulks and cuts since then to try to achieve even better health and to feel more comfortable in my body. Um, the first series was not completed properly. It was a dirty bulk and I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, so I hired a coach and I worked with him for about two years until just recently discontinuing with him. And during that journey, we also healed SIBO and H. pylori. Um, and then we tried to work on my body transformation. I told him repeatedly throughout the process that I felt like I didn't look as lean as I did before I started with him. And I felt like I wasn't really progressing. And he kind of just kept brushing me off, maybe gaslit me a little bit, um, told me that it was just body image issues uh, because the scale weight was down, which the scale has been down since I started working with him. I've lost almost 30 pounds, but I can't lift as heavy. My body, I truly feel like doesn't look as lean as when I started. And I just don't know what to do. I'm I'm really frustrated and discouraged. I would like to see how lean my body could get just kind of to show myself I could do it. I've put in the work. Um, I don't really want to be stage lean. Like I don't want to compete, but I just want to see like a little bit more definition really look cut. Um, I consistently hit my protein target. I've run MAPS anabolic aesthetics probably twice with performance breaking them up the first time. And then this last cycle, I've been through anabolic symmetry aesthetics, and now I'm in anabolic advanced and I'm in about phase two, week two. So I don't know really where to go from here. I've been in a cut since about March and the scale's going down and I feel like I'm still gaining strength in anabolic advanced, but I'm still not seeing like what I want in my composition. Okay. Mm -hmm. By the way, um, you sent a picture in, uh, you lost a hundred pounds. Yeah, you're, lo you're looking good. And you look for not like, by the way. I'm going to, I mean, look, uh, I could t typically tell when someone loses a dramatic amount of weight because there's changes to their physique, but your body rebounded exceptionally well. You're doing really good. And you said you're at what? 22% body fat. That's estimated. We, my wife started doing calipers on me at the beginning of the year. Okay. And so when we started, I think we we're at about 25%. And then the last measurements were, I believe in mid April and they were about 22%. Okay. You're doing, yeah, you're, you're doing good. You're doing really good. And when you lost 30 pounds, you said you didn't look as lean. I, I doubt you lost 30 pounds of muscle. Um, do you know what your body fat percentage was then at the, when you were 30 pounds heavier? No, I don't. Um, when I started with a coach, I was 172, but I also, like I've been watching strength as well and bench and overhead press have always been kind of my lifts. And so this is what's concerning to me is I used to be able to push 165 and a max rep bench and probably close to 80, 85 and an overhead press. And I'm lucky if I get 35s on the bar now when I bench. Hmm. So what you weighed, give me, give me your body weight when you were pressing 165, 170. Yeah, I think 170, 172. Okay. And what do you weigh now? Uh, as of this morning, 140. Okay. Yep. I do want to say you, you will see strength loss typically when you lose weight. There's a few reasons for it. And when you're in a cut for that long. Yeah. So you're going to see that. Um, although I, 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 I do think you lost a little more strength than you should have, Yeah. but being in a cut that long can sometimes do that. Uh, just from energy. Like for example, if I put you on a bulk right now, you'll probably see a strength boost. You're getting stronger now with anabolic advanced while you're still following the same diet. Yeah, I started anabolic advanced probably about six weeks ago. I had I did the week de deload after the first phase, and I'm still adding either reps or weight to almost every lift. Yeah. Some are a little more challenging, that's, but most of them I'm adding weight to. You're, that's that's you're, phenomenal. Yeah, that's great you're, you're killing it. Yeah, what's now, Julie? Yeah. What's uh what's uh your calorie intake at roughly? Do you have it? Do you, are you tracking right now? Oh yeah, I track diligently. I'm constantly hitting at least 150 protein, and I get about 16 to 16.50 in calories. Yeah, okay. Maybe a reverse diet for a little. I bit. think a little reverse Just diet little would bump. be good. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, you're crushing it. Right. Uh, th that you're getting stronger. You've been on this cut for so long, from where you started, and then recently down 30 pounds. Um, you're doing really well, and you're getting stronger at 1600 calories, which is really good because it's still kind of low calorie. 
I'd like to see you do a little bit of a re reverse diet. And then once you get your calories up to a certain point, start I, to cut again. I do want to comment, Julia, on why, because I know I know as what it's like when you're in this when you're in this position and it feels like it's so damn slow. And I know that's probably how you feel. It's just like, man, I'm just consistent. I work hard. I'm diligent as fuck, and it's just yeah. feels like it's moving really slow. And you know, it kind of is for you right now. But a big reason why that is, it's where we are metabolically right now. You're at a place right now where you have to eat as little as 1,600 calories to lose body fat, and it's working. You're actually moving in the right direction, and for all in all, uh, I know you're not. You would like to see more aesthetically, like in the mirror or whatever like that. But from what I'm hearing with your numbers, your body fat percentage, you are moving in the right direction. But it's so slow because of the where your metabolism metabolism is currently right now. That 1,600 calories is how low you have to be just to move in the right direction. So what what would benefit us? is to reverse diet up and get to a place where you can eat 25, 26, 2700 calories and not put body fat on so that when you come when I bring you back down to say 1800 or 2000 you move a lot faster and that's just because you've got the metabolism roaring again and what's happened is your metabolism is adapted to how low of calories and the activity that you do so even though you're doing a good job and you're actually moving the right direction it's the progress is really slow if we wanted to ramp that progress up you were a client of mine then I would actually put you on a mini bulk. We would go on a bulk for a while with the yeah. goal of- A nice build, steady one. Yeah. We're not going to see, uh, I, at this point, I don't care about the scale right now. I even don't care what you think we look like right now. It's like, I just want to get, our goal is, can I not put a bunch of weight on you and get you up to say like 2,500 calories and maintaining at that? And what we should see is a, a pretty good strength increase and hopefully your body kind of leveling out there. And then that, that becomes our new- you know, uh, our, our, our new level of where your metabolism is at. And then I can bring you back down and then you should see faster results. Yeah. That's kind of what's I, going I, on. I right want to add this too, Julie. How long ago was it, uh, that you were a hundred pounds overweight and how long were you living that lifestyle for that led to that, that 100 pound, you know, uh, weight gain? Um, I was 250, probably around, I would say like 2010 and then I dropped it and I was probably, I, I, I had the weight loss. I was down at 150 by at least 2011. So it was probably, I was 250 much. Like I lost it over a, a long period of time, a few couple years. So, okay. and I've been doing this, you know, the resistance training and stuff since then. And the last time I was on a reverse diet with this coach, he got me up to 2300 and I finally got to the point where I was like, I can't eat anymore. And I was like about to explode. Um, but we just didn't, he kind of like, I, I don't know what your guys' thoughts are, but we kind of like stepped it down in baby steps. So I was constantly like cutting a little bit here and there. This time when my wife has kind of been holding my hand through this, um, she just said, okay, we've been sitting at 2000 for a while here. Let's just cut 25% and drop to 16. And I've been here at the same spot since she dropped me in March. And I'm still progressing without even dropping any more. But yeah. when he reverse dieted me, I felt like I just got super puffy. I don't know. It it may have been a lot of water weight, but I just felt like I looked might have been not what, might, might have good. been something we're eating too. Yeah, so. but you know, here's mm. the deal though. If you feel good at where you're at and you're moving and you're moving in the right direction and you're getting stronger and you're okay with the food that you're eating, you're not like, oh, I'm starving. I mean, there's nothing wrong with staying where you're at. I mean, that's the the truth is, and that's why I think we all started this as like you're doing actually pretty good. the The hardest part, and this is the this is the hard the frustrating part about being in the Goldilocks zone, which you're kind of at, which is just the right amount of calories that you don't see huge swings, but you just slowly lean out over time. Is is actually that it's it it's really slow, but it's actually right where you want to be. I mean, and if I and if I had a client that was expressing this to me and they're they like, I want to see it faster. Well, what I would do is I would do I would interrupt your cut because you've been in it for March. So a little three week bulk and then go back down again would would probably help kick start and speed yeah. some things up. Yeah. But you're actually at a really good place. If you're satisfied calorie wise, you're seeing your strength stay the same or go up and you're slowly leaning out. That's a really good place to be. There's, uh, there's nothing wrong at all with staying where you're at what, and what, just letting it. And what's your wife saying to you? Just curiosity. What is she? What I'd like to hear her opinion. I have a feel. I have a feeling like you're right. confirming stuff that she's probably already told yeah, you. Yeah, she in the background nodding her head. Like what's what's happening here? <laughs> 
Oh, he is. <laughs> she is actually back there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, she tells me all the time that she can see progress and I can't. So, I mean, maybe there is a little bit of it's yeah. self bias, but, um, I mean, we are actually getting ready to come out of the cut and go into either a like a maintenance or it looks like now a reverse or reverse diet on, based on your advice. Yeah. Um, but that's where she's at because she said she didn't want me to be here very long. She wanted me to get into the cut and then get out of it as soon as possible. So that's why we did a quick drop and she left me here. We were making progress. So she didn't change anything because I felt good. I didn't feel like shit on this cut like I did before. Um, and she was like, if you're making progress, don't change anything. We just want to get in it, get down to business, get out of it, and then get you back. Julie, uh, she's got Julie, great, that's great advice. Julie, yeah. get, get out of your own way, Julie. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you're getting in your own way. It's, it's pretty clear now yeah. that the, you're, you're the, the, the challenges you're running into right now are, are really with the mindset and I want things to move in a particular way and I'm not happy, but you are, I'm going to tell you right now, you're crushing, especially when I, when you, from where you came from. Where you came from, the fact that you're able to get your metabolism to move the way that you are, where you can get up to 2,200 calories, bring it up to 1,600 calories, get strong. Off, You know how hard that is to do when you've lost 100 pounds? It's very, very, very challenging. And you're doing it like you're doing great and you're strong. So I think you're just you're, you're moving in the right direction. I think just be calm and cool with it. And here's what I'll tell you about that, because I can get stuck in that all the time, is really be in the present. Try to be in the present as much as possible. Try not to think about where you're going to be or where I want to go. Try to think more about the now. Am I am I enjoying my workout right now? Am I enjoying what I'm doing right now? Am I healthier today than I was just a do, year ago? Do I feel good right now? Because what that'll do is, is it's going to make this process enjoyable. And then when it becomes so enjoyable that you just love doing it, well, then you're going to hit those milestones automatically. It's not something you're... you're you're constantly looking at it because right now what it feels like is you're sacrificing the present you for the future you and the future you that you've, that you've created hasn't, isn't coming here fast enough. So it feels like it's just, I'm sacrificing for what, but if you enjoy the present now, there's no sacrifice. Everybody wins you now, you in the future, you're all winning. You're doing a great job. I, and I think you're getting great advice from your wife. I think she's on the right track. Totally. And I, that's exactly what I would do with you. If I would I would run you in these these cuts for a short period of time to see some nice results. As I think things start to slow up, I'd put you in a reverse diet for you know three weeks then come back down to the cut, reverse diet. And we just keep bouncing in and out of these mini cuts, mini bulks. And and continue to see you just slowly lean out and you know try and keep as much strength as we can. I think you're doing really good, and I think you got somebody who's got good advice for you. So stay the course, trust the process. Where do you think I should go next, program wise? As far as I mean, should I just start from scratch and go back to anabolic and run them again, or uh, after anabolic advance, I like either symmetry or performance. I do like how you guys were doing that too. So I don't know if yeah, that's partly no, from her advice, good. but you've been—I heard the way you were rotating, interrupting good. With performance. Yeah, I good. mean, that's good. Yeah. That's good balance that you have right now. Totally. Yeah, you could go. You could go symmetry. You could go performance. If you want to go more bodybuilder, split would even be fine. But I still would like symmetry and performance thrown in at least after that. Yeah, as long as you interrupt those kind of bodybuilder s programs with a performance or symmetry every two or three program rotations, you're good. You're good. Do you have all the programs we mentioned? Do you have all of them, or, or what are you missing? Let me give you something. Uh, the only thing I think I don't have that I actually thought, based on my complaint, that you guys were going to send me was Muscle Mommy. While I'm not a mommy, <laughs> it sounded yeah, like. Yeah. <laughs> We'll send it over. You'll yeah, get it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's you'll it, like yeah. that program. Yeah, yeah, that's good it's just too. a term. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. I think what I was going to do, though, uh, aside from Muscle Mommy, which is coming my way now, is I think I was thinking about breaking up Anabolic Advance since it's such a high volume with like 15. I haven't run 15. I do have 15, but I haven't run it yet. Oh, you'd love it. Especially if you feel at the end like you need a little bit of a break uh, because of the volume. You'd be a good interruption. Yeah, yeah, you would like it. And you'll probably get real strong. A lot of people get real strong following that that protocol. Okay. Yeah. I'll do, I'll do 15 and then I'll go into muscle mommy and just start putting yeah. some bulks in the books then I guess. All awesome. right. We'll send that over to you. All right. Yeah. Thanks for calling in. All right. All right. Thanks guys. You got Dude. it. That was fun. She's so, crushing it. Yeah. She's yeah. getting good advice. Too. By the way, the, the weight. Okay. So the, I get it. It's the way she looks slow. after losing a hundred pounds. Oh, incredible. Yeah. I mean, she's doing phenomenal. And and you have to, totally. so it, it's, I try and explain this when I talk about like the, 
the ratio of like, you know, when people get to a place where they feel like, man, I can, I eat one bad thing and it sticks to me. It's like a lot of that has to do with the ratio to where you're currently at. Meaning her metabolism is at a place where 16 to 1800 is kind of maintenance, right? Maybe 1800 is maintenance, 1600 is getting her to lose slightly like that. And so it's just, it's a, it's a smaller percentage of just her, her metabolism. Right. A 300 or 400 calorie meal is a, is a, a you know, extra meal is a, is a large percent, percentage of her total calories. Right. So, it, and so it's just going to move a little bit slower. She, she, she's got a, you know, a four cylinder engine that she's running and she's running it very efficiently and very well. And she's, it's performing very good for her. But you you are you have V eight supercharged expectations, mm -hmm. and if you want that type of swings and movement in your body composition like that, you've got to build that engine. And so, or just be okay that you've got a very very efficient four cylinder that you're. I mean, she's doing she's getting great out of what her her metabolism is at. And so, if but if she was eating three thousand calories and that was what maintained her, and then she cuts down to twenty five, well, yeah, then you're going to see these more dramatic swings and so it's like you have two but when she said you know hey when i was eating 2300 i felt like i was stuffing myself well i also don't want to force you to try and build your metabolism up to 2800 calories if you feel uncomfortable eating that so she's in a really good place and, and doing a much better job than i think she realizes all right i know you like that episode if you did check this one out